plays such an important role in our coming together, um, recognizing Thanksgiving prelude there, and before we're done, you'll recognize Christmas postlude. And in fact, this service will have the feel of Thanksgiving to it, but it'll also have the feel of Christmas, of Advent, and you see, you see an Advent wreath up here, and we'll have our first Advent reading, and it, it's all about hope. And yet it connects with thanksgiving because uh, we'll sing songs of thanksgiving and we'll also have a passage of scripture that we'll look at that reflects on, on giving thanks and yet it's thanks to Christ the Savior. And so you'll, you'll be torn or doubly blessed with the two holidays in mind. In the scriptures we read this. Shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us. We are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Let's stand and sing for the beauty of the earth. Lord of all. Thee we raise, this our hymn of grateful praise. For the beauty of the earth, for the glory of the skies, for the love which from our birth over and around us lies. Lord of all, to Thee we raise, this our hymn of grateful praise. For the beauty of each hour, of the day and of the night, hill and vale and tree and flower, sun and moon and stars of light, Lord of all, to Thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise. For the joy of human love, brother. 
brother, sister, parent, child, friends on earth and friends above, for all gentle thoughts and mild, Lord of all, to Thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise. For Thyself best gift divine, to our race so freely him, for that great, great love of Thine, peace on earth and joy in heaven. Lord of all, to Thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise. That is a wonderful hymn of why why we are grateful to the Lord for such simple gifts. But as the scripture reminds us, every good gift is from the Father of lights in whom there's no shifting shadows. And so let's sing this song now, which is, oh, that's right. No, we can back up. I've forgotten about that. Let's uh, do a responsive reading. You can have a seat during this. Give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known among the nations what he's done. We give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, his love endures forever. Let us give thanks to the Lord, because of his deliverance. The Lord is our strength and our shield, our hearts trust in him, and we are helpful. We give thanks to you, O God. For your name is near. We enter your gates with thanksgiving. We give thanks to you and sing of your holy name. Okay, let's stand again and sing this song of thanks to the Lord. Thank you, Lord. I come before you today And there's just one thing that I want to say Thank you, Lord Thank you, Lord For all you've given to me For all the blessings that I cannot see Charm. I will bless your name. Thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. darkness and gave me your light. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You took my sin and my shame. You took my sickness and healed all my pain. I will bless your name, oh, thank you, Lord. Oh, I just want to thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. For saving my soul Thank you, Lord For 
nation so rich and free. We thank you, Lord, for your good gifts which this world cannot provide. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your your comforting presence that gives us a peace that surpasses all understanding. And in that sense, it doesn't matter what happens, what unfolds in this old world. You are with us. Your watch care gives us that comfort and assurance and even a boldness to, to enter into today and to face whatever happens tomorrow. We thank you, Lord. We thank you. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We have an Advent reading now, and it occurs to me we could use the piano mic. This is the first Sunday in Advent. Today we light one purple candle. This is the candle of hope. Advent is a time of waiting and hoping. We wait for the day when we celebrate again the birth of Jesus. We hope that everyone will come to know God and to worship God. When we look at the first candle, we remember God's promise. God promised to send a Savior to the people. When we listen to our scripture reading, we hear that the prophet Isaiah wrote about God. God is the potter who molds us. We know that the gospel witness is one that helps us understand that God is loving and just. God brings peace. This gives us hope. We anticipate again the birth of baby Jesus, remembering that Jesus helps us know God's love for us. Isaiah 64, 8 says, Yet, O Lord, you are the, our Father. We are the clay. You are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. Think about a potter. A potter takes clay, forms it in a way that is pleasing. That is what God is able to do with each person. We are reminded that we are all the work of God's hands. Talk together about how we are formed by God. Remember, together the gifts and talents of each person. How do we use these gifts that God has formed in us? Who are the people in our world who need God's hope? Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for your son Jesus. Thank you for the words of the prophet Isaiah that remind us that you are the source of our hope. Help us to live each day, allowing you to form us in a way that brings about your kingdom here on earth. Amen. Thank you, Ivan, Rosemary. There are just certain traditions that I, that I enjoy about Fish Lake Chapel, and it's these two, the reading and the lighting of the candle. It's, 
I don't think anyone noticed that at all. Um, the children were here, we'd talk about looking in the right place to find something, um, but you can, you can kind of keep it there. Uh, it, there are certain places that you, you just look for things. I guess we could scroll through some of these. If, if, if you were posed, if you posed a question to a child, where would you find a toothbrush? Uh, this you, you you go to the bathroom. Um, where would you go to find uh, what was the next one? Oh yeah, your boots because you're going to need snow boots. By the way, I'm glad for and I'm grateful, genuinely grateful for any day in November where we don't need to wear snow boots. I'm I'm really good about that. And then uh, where would you go to find leftovers? And I found this little saying: uh, leftovers are for quitters. So apparently, people that stop eating is a quitter, but because they have leftovers. Anyway, uh, I know where to find them. You go to the refrigerator. And where do you go to find Christmas gifts? Under the tree. So um, I, uh, I, I wanted to tell you about how, how we look in the wrong places sometime. I lost my keys. Anybody here ever lost their keys, their car keys? Okay, <laughs> confession is good. Josh, you've never lost them yet. Okay, that's Impressive. All right. I, I remember losing my car keys, and I didn't want to tell my wife right away, so I, I try to retrace my steps. I, I look in my coat pockets, right? Look in the coat pockets, not there. Um, I, I look in pants pockets, not there. Um, I, I look in the car. Not there. Uh, look in the, the feet area of the car. Not there. Um, now I'm starting to really struggle with where it is. I, I trace my steps to and from the house. Uh, this is in Cooperstown. Uh, not there. Um, now I'm starting to get a little desperate, almost to the point where I'll tell my wife that I lost my car keys. <laughs> Um, I, I think I even looked for a spare and found a spare, but I had all kinds of keys on this. And how do you lose car keys and all the other keys that are on it? And, and uh, I, I started checking where you throw your pants and maybe they fell out of the pants and on the floor there and wasn't finding them anywhere. And I, I was looking in the wrong places. You know where I found my car keys? Bev, did you find them or did I find them? Okay. Um, they were in the refrigerator. <laughs> Silly me. Okay, so you found them. They were in the refrigerator. Silly me. My car keys were in the refrigerator. Because that's where I put the groceries that I got in and lunch and meat or whatever, and my car keys were in my hand and put them in the refrigerator. Silly me, uh, looking in all the wrong places. So the, the, the last question that I would pose to kids is, uh, where do you look when you're looking for hope? And that's what some people are doing nowadays. They, they want hope. They need hope. And, and our, our first Advent candle is a reminder that everyone needs hope. So I, I want you to see this picture. One that comes after this. All right? Let that sort of haunt you for a little while. Something doesn't look right in this picture. In 1965, naval aviator James B. Stockdale became one of the first American pilots to be shot down during the Vietnam War. This is James Stockdale. Naturally, the dark and ominous look here and expression is during his confinement. As a prisoner of the Viet Cong, he spent seven years as a POW. Okay, you try to think about that. I, I haven't even been in Malacca for seven years. It's been six years and a month. Seven years as a POW 
during which he was frequently tortured in an attempt to break him and get him to denounce the U.S. involvement in the war. He was chained for days in his cell with his hands above his head so he couldn't even swat the mosquitoes off of his body. And if you were to see him after his confinement, so this ends with a good, a good ending, is he, he forever walked with a limp because they broke his, his legs, his limbs, and they were not set properly. Worst, one of the worst things done to him is, is he was held in isolation from the other American POWs. He was allowed to see only his guard and interrogators. You might wonder, how do you survive seven years of that? Just try to imagine the length of that, the suffering of that. And as he looked back on that time, Stockdale says it was his hope that kept him alive. Not my word, his. Hope that kept him alive. Hope that one day he'd be going home. That each day could be the day of his release. Without hope, he knew he would die as others had done. Today we're going to look at a passage of a man that was a POW, so to speak, in darkness, in confinement, because of blindness. And yet there came a day when there was hope that arrived in the person of Jesus Christ. What I want you to listen to during this message is for people that you know or meet or care about or read about as everyone needs hope everyone needs hope but where are they looking many are looking in the wrong places let's pray Lord now as we go to your word we ask that you speak to us from the scriptures by your spirit and who knows, there may be people that will meet, or people that are listening to this, that right now feel a desperate need for hope. And so we thank you that you are that source. It's in our Savior's name we pray. Amen. Well, we're going to go to a passage of Scripture that, that is a, a, an excellent Handling of what we're doing today, which is sort of Thanksgiving, sort of Christmas. All right? So turn with me to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, beginning at verse 46. Mark, chapter 10. Beginning at verse 46, we read this. Uh, they came to Jericho. You remember Jericho from the Old Testament days? Joshua fought the battle of Jericho. All right, that was one of the first places that the, the Jewish nation entered into in the battle. All right, so a very familiar old site. They came to Jericho as Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were, were leaving the city. A blind man, Bartimaeus, which means ton of, son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. All right, so you got a blind man. I want you to try to appreciate what it means to be blind and an older man. In my imagination, I imagine a man that used to be the breadwinner. A man who, who has been reduced to begging. You ever been in that position where you actually have to beg someone for help? It's a difficult time. That's a, that's a, well, after a while, I, I imagine this man got hardened in his heart from begging. And, and the routine was if people came by to spread out a, a mat or something to receive coins and you've got your hand out and everyone knows what you want. You, you want a little bit of money, a little bit of food. Think of how awkward it is for you when you come by those 
exit ramps or entry ramps or in the big city, the street lights, and there's someone with a sign begging. This particular day, uh, Bartimaeus was begging and not getting much. I imagine some days were like that. But then he heard a crowd, heard a crowd because he's blind, of course. And, and so that brought with it possibilities of maybe getting some, some handouts. And so he, he wanted to put his mat out and, and the crowd came closer and closer. He would listen. And normally he would hear the crowd talk about Jericho in the old days and, and maybe, maybe the ruins. Or maybe they're talking about going to Jerusalem. But this crowd was talking about Jesus. And I imagine Bartimaeus had heard about Jesus before. The miracles. The amazing miracles miracles that were performed by Jesus. But I would like to submit to you that Bartimaeus saw something about Jesus that the other people who could see didn't see. That Jesus was the son of David. All right, so let's go back to the to the text. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Son of David. Now this is the first time someone dared to shout out son of David. That, that's not something just anyone shouts out. Because with, with the title Son of David, well, that goes back to the promise given to King David. And let me read that promise for you. The Lord himself will establish a house for you. This is God talking to King David. I will raise up your offspring to succeed you. That's the Son of David. Who will come from your own body, the lineage of David. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And yet Bartimaeus is calling out to Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Do you know what he's saying? That Jesus, he's, a, he's publicly acknowledging and identifying Jesus as the son of David. What's another word for calling this future son of David? The Messiah. So this is a man who saw something about Jesus, heard about the miracles, heard about the teachings, and put two and two together, and he sees the son of David. This blind man sees the son of David, and he calls out, because he knows this is the source of hope. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. It's, it's one thing to, to, to beg for uh, a handout. That's pretty humiliating. It's another to beg for mercy from God Almighty. So he had a decision to make. And we see that decision was to call out. And what motivated blind Bartimaeus was hope. This Messiah, since he really is the Messiah, he can perform miracles. And in fact, there is, there is a truth about Jesus when he began his ministry. Listen to what uh, Jesus read when he began his ministry. It just so happened to be on that day in the synagogue that he went to that it, he had the opportunity to read. And he, and he read from the scroll of Isaiah. And this is what he read. The Spirit of the Lord is on me. Anointed one is the Spirit anointed one. 
The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me, that's the Messiah tone there, to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and what Bartimaeus had in mind, recovery of sight for the blind and to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus was the source of hope and a blind man could see it. You know, sometimes we just... uh, we just prejudge people that are begging, people that are poor, people that are maybe not churchgoers. But Jesus knows the heart. So let's, let's see what unfolds here. Verse uh, 48. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more. Son of David, have mercy on me. He's persevering because there is a hope out there now. Why is he being quieted? Well, I I think there are two possibilities. One is that the crowd was offended that this blind beggar, who does he know? What does he know? He's no rabbi. He's no Pharisee or Sadducee, and he has the audacity to call Jesus publicly the son of David. And so the crowd told him to be quiet. You don't know what you're talking about. Be quiet. Or the other likely possibility is they didn't want to be interrupted by this man who's a beggar. He's not important. Jesus is important. And so they wanted him to be quiet. But here's where we appreciate something about Jesus. He never ignores a cry for hope. He never ignores it. If you call out to the Lord, we see this in the example of this blind beggar, Bartimaeus. Jesus, the same yesterday, today, and forever, He does not ignore the cry for hope. So let's see what Jesus has to say. Verse 49. Uh, Jesus stopped and said, call him. Call him. Now, I know last week, uh, Pastor Bruce was uh, giving the Thanksgiving message on the 10 lepers. And he was able to heal from a distance. He said, go to the priest, present yourself to the priest. And as they were going, the healing took place and then one remembered to return and give thanks. And Jesus noticed that, Jesus appreciated that. So we, we know that Jesus can heal with just a word, a command. And here's uh, a lowly beggar, not really worth the time. Everyone else is telling them to be quiet. Jesus could have said, um, receive your sight. Okay, let's get going to Jerusalem. But Jesus doesn't do that because he wants this man to meet the source of hope and he wants that crowd to learn something. And part of what he wants this crowd to learn is to treat people with respect. Because now it's going to be reversed. Now the people that were exhorting him to be quiet now become the vehicle of inviting him to come. And I think Jesus enjoys this whole dynamic. He says to them, oh, call him. Call him. Can you picture that? Uh, The rest of verse 49, we read, So they called to the blind man, Cheer up, on your feet, he's calling you. It's just wonderful. Cheer up, get on your feet, he's calling for you. Have have you ever been in a crowd where, where you've been called out? You know, I, re, I recall a story of our, our son, Ben, and when he was kind of early on in Alarm.com and, 
And uh, he, he went uh, along with hundreds of other staff from different areas of the country. I think it was down to like Atlanta, and it was a big gathering of of uh, several hundred people. And and then it was like the vice president got up and and um, he was greeting the people, encouraging them on. These were in the days where you could get together. And, and then he said, well, you know, I'm, I'm so impressed with the quality of our staff. The quality of handling even the simplest of things like a phone call. And he said, I was listening to one amongst our staff. And I would like to thank Ben Clifton for what he had done, how he treated it. Ben Clifton, you know, and all eyes are looking around to where Ben Clifton is. And I don't remember, did Ben have to stand up or just wave his hand? Uh, but they looked for the one that had beat red face and they found him. Um, and, and, and then the president got up and I don't remember why it was, but the president of the company even said, and I would also like to thank uh, the one staff amongst us who did an exceptional job that I was listening in on and, and and it was Ben Clifton. So twice this gathering of, a, of several hundred people, Ben Clifton got singled out. What, uh, when Ben tells a story, it is just hilarious. But he was raised up and acknowledged by the crowd. And you, you know those CEOs enjoyed the whole dynamic. Does Jesus enjoy these dynamics? Someone calling out for hope, stopping his agenda with someone as lowly as a beggar. Absolutely, he does. And so that's why Jesus' response does not, does not uh, surprise us. Verse 50, throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. So all eyes are on this blind beggar, and you could tell he was blind by how he made his way forward. You know, I, I imagine him reaching out so that he doesn't uh, stumble into anyone. I imagine the crowd backing off, maybe murmuring, it's blind, come on, open up. Uh, and, and he makes his way, and Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? Uh, that's kind of a foolish question. Why would Jesus ask that? Well, Jesus knew what he was going to do that day before it even began. He's the all-knowing God um, who is God the Son, fully God, fully man. I think it's because he enjoys seeing faith being expressed. He enjoys seeing this dynamic of hope being called out for and being received. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him, and the blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Verse 52, go, Jesus said, your faith has healed you. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. So meeting hope face to face gives us insight. Three, three insights about this. First of all, Jesus wants to make it clear that people matter to God. We see this over and over and over in the Gospels. People matter to God. doesn't matter if, if you're a ruler or if you're a beggar. If you're blind, a leper, a woman with a blood issue, you read this in the scriptures, people matter to God. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what your circumstances are. I want you to remember this. You matter to the Lord. And when your circumstances in life um, prompt you to call out to God, you can know that Jesus hears you calling out. And as I, as I look out among you, um, for some of you who have gone through some, some trials, from accidents to surgeries and setbacks and it prompts you to call out to God or those who love you and know you call out to God just be reminded 
people, one by one by one, matter to God. He knows full well that he is your only hope. He's just waiting for you to realize it. Well, secondly, critics matter to God. Well, not everyone has infinite patience, especially about needy people. This crowd, just as soon this Bartimaeus be quiet and, you know, just stop complicating things. But Jesus wanted to engage the crowd. And it's all in that simple statement, call it. It changed the dynamic from being critics to being engaged, being part of the solution. You're going to meet people that are skeptical of Jesus Christ. That are critical of Christianity. In in, uh, our Bible instruction class, we were talking about... um, our American heritage and and Christopher Columbus, uh, the Pilgrims. Well, nowadays uh, there's a lot of criticism aimed at those forefathers because it is assumed and presumed that this is all about a superior white uh, religion. Very critical toward Christianity. But one by one, especially if they end up being in an emergency situation, they'll call out to a God that maybe they've been critical about. But God hears them, and that those critics of Christianity will realize that it, it is not a white Caucasian religion. Far from it. It comes from the Middle East. It comes from the Jewish nation. And it is... It is rooted in the hearts of sinners calling out to hope for forgiveness of sin. And lastly, faith matters to God. Faith matters to Jesus. And this is what I think Jesus just enjoyed, the whole dynamic of of the faith of this man coming to the son of David, for having having the, the insight and the foresight of recognizing that Jesus is the Messiah and rewarding that? Well, started by asking him a question. What do you want me to do? And he went public with what he wanted. I think this whole matter of voicing what your heart's desire is, what your hope is, is what you need to do with the Lord. It could be something as voicing out loud your prayer. I think this is why, why uh, in, in the Beatitudes, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, rather, Jesus talked about how what you do in secret, your Heavenly Father sees in secret. And, and so quite often we, we pray silently, even when we're alone. But I would admonish you to... Um, to make it known audibly. Say your prayer out loud to the Lord, especially if you're reaching out for hope. Once you go public, what you believe in your heart is transformed into faith in your very soul. I I also think that's why uh, Billy Graham crusades or any kind of, of uh, gatherings where someone says, if, if, you, if you would like to receive this, this offering of salvation, just come forward. Then, then that transformation of, of what you, you believe in your heart is transformed into faith in the source of hope, of forgiveness. And Jesus will reward that that kind of faith. He did with Bartimaeus. I'd like to return to this um, picture and a couple more of James Stockdale. 
He was reflecting on his ordeal. But I, I, I want to give you um, some more insight from what he reflected on from his time as a POW, not just about himself, but the others who couldn't make it, who couldn't survive the years. He said, I never lost faith in the end of the story. You know, that's, that's this hope that is transformed into a faith. I never lost faith in the end of the story. I never doubted not only that I would get out, but also that I would prevail in the end and turn the experience into the defining event in my life, which in retrospect, I would not trade. I find that hard to believe, but this is his testimony. He wouldn't trade it for everything, anything. It, it redefined his life. This, this matter of, of reaching out to God in faith, when you still are skeptical and critical, and yet part of you wants to reach out and you go public in your voice, public walking down the aisle, public going to someone saying, I need to get right with God. said uh, we're going to be out by Christmas and Christmas would come Christmas would go and they say well we're going to be out by Easter Easter would come and Easter would go and then Thanksgiving and then Christmas again and Stockdale said they died of a broken heart what was the difference with them and with Stockdale is he would hope each day. So those others are examples of those looking for hope in all the wrong places. Then Stockdale added this. This is a very important lesson. You must never confuse faith that you will prevail in the end which you can never afford to lose. With the discipline to confront the most brutal facts of your current reality, whatever they might be. Faith will prevail, but be realistic of what you're going through, whatever they might be. Bartimaeus met the source of hope. It changed everything, no matter what he had to go through. As we have gathered on this Thanksgiving and we're on the, uh, the beginning of an Advent series, we remember that Christ is the source of our hope. It transforms our simple beliefs into a great faith in the Lord. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you have not changed and that we see in this passage of scripture that you hear the voice of one crying out to you with even just the simplest of beliefs you stopped and met it we are well we imagine ourselves with this crowd and some might picture themselves as the critics of the crowd others would identify with with blind Bartimaeus, knowing they can go to no one else. We thank you that you care about both, that you love both, that you went to the cross to be the Savior for all. And so we remember this and give thanks. Amen. Well, let's close our time together by singing our closing song, which brings us fully to Christmas.
Come, thou long expected Jesus, born to set thy people free. Let's stand and sing. <laughs>